All right, I think we'll get uh, started. We got pretty full, full room here today. Um, so uh, the lecture for today is going to be on um, DNP physics. Um, you know the what I've uh, learned in in being in the field and and also trying to really learn a little bit more details about what's exactly going on in, in hyper and the DNP method of hyperpolarization that we use is that um, it's it's actually amazing how much we really uh, don't always understand some of these phenomena. There's a lot of uh, I'll describe some of w what I've come to understand are the best theories for how mostly how DNP works, but actually uh, getting in there thinking about the spin physics, the interactions between different types of radicals and different uh, nuclei and, and these different mixtures is, is um, it's probably the subject of PhD theses and things. It's, uh, so there's, there's still some open questions in this area, but um, I'll try and give you today is, is a picture for... Um, for the basics of, of, of what we know and, and some intuition about what's going on. So, uh, and then the lab today will be the same as uh, last week, except if you did hypersense last week, do spin lab this week, and with Jeremy back there, and if you did spin lab last week, do hypersense with uh, Sukumar um, down the NMR lab uh, this week. Uh, any questions before I get started? Okay, um, so we're going to be talking about polarization again, um, where in our basic uh, principle here is that normally our spins are basically randomly aligned and without the presence of a magnetic field, and then in the presence of some magnetic field, and sorry, I apologize, I meant to, I changed this in the old slides, as, uh, uh, as uh, was pointed out, this is not the it's a hyperbolic tangent on the next slide is the correct formula here. <laughs> um, but anyway, in the presence of a magnetic field, you get some bulk uh, net magnetization due to the slight preference of the spins to align with the magnetic field. So uh, d looking a little bit closer about at the uh, factors that influence polarization, uh, um, this is the... Uh, equation that's being plotted here at the right where we're looking at temperature versus polarization is this hyperbolic tangent function. <clears throat> um, and here it's just being plotted as a function of T uh, temperature, which you can see uh, temperature is inversely proportional to polarization. So as we go to uh, lower and lower temperatures, our polarization increases. Um, we also have these uh, factors of the gyromagnetic ratio. And so you're going to have, thus, in this picture here, you have three different curves, whether you have protons, uh, carbon-13, or, or even electron spins. They all have different uh, polarizations. And, and this is accounted for by this gamma factor there. Um, and then, of course, the factor you should all be pretty well familiar with now is the magnetic field itself. So the larger the magnetic field, that you're under, the higher um, polarization you're going to have. And then these other uh, terms in here, the, this K or KB and, and H are the Planck and Boltzmann uh, constants. So um, to give you uh, an idea of, of some values for uh, typical polarization, so the top, I've just gone through the calculation here for uh, some. So under room, so our, under like a typical clinical MRI conditions. So at say room temperature, pretty close relatively to body temperature, and three Tesla. Um, we have a, a proton spin polarization, 0.001 percent. Uh, carbon 13 spin polarization is a quarter of that because of the gyromagnetic ratio difference and. And similarly, uh, electrons, so this free radical 
or uh, electron paramagnetic agent are a couple of names we use for this. These are going to have a polarization of 0.65% under these sort of normal uh, clinical conditions here. And this is because electrons have a much uh, higher gyromagnetic ratio uh, than nuclear spins generally. And then just looking quickly, you can see here at the relationship with temperature, that as soon as we go down to uh, low temperature, so conditions like we've got uh, inside the, uh, our hyperpolarizers, either, either spin lab or hypersense. Um, now, just by the virtue of going to low temperature, we can, these polarizations are, are bumping up quite a bit because um, of this 1 over T relationship here. And now protons are 0.3%, are carbon about 0.1%, and, and electrons are 98%, almost uh, completely polarized. So almost completely aligned. All the spins, are, uh, electron spins are almost completely aligned with the magnetic field in this case. Um, you know, and I was, so I was going through this presentation here, practicing and realizing it was kind of boring. So I wanted to get you a little excited about hyperpolarization. And what I discovered is I need a graphic like this. I need to, uh, this is from the Pines Lab at Berkeley, which is, uh, you know, a revered uh, group of NMR uh, development, and they have this awesome graph. This is hyperpolarization right here. Get excited. You know, much more than this, right? So the smaller one you need has to help me visualize In this picture? Yeah. I don't even, I didn't even look <laughs> close enough <laughs> to determine what it means. Um, maybe, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can we can draw some conclusions. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we may have to get in touch with the artist. To do our own. So um, anyway, now you're excited. Keep paying attention. <laughs> All right, but really, actually, what was being shown in the previous slide there is that. Our first source of hyperpolarization is, is pretty straightforward, actually. It's going to low temperature. When we take our pyruvic acid, even without mixing it with any electron source, we actually get a several hundred-fold uh, polarization enhancement. So simply by taking our carbon-13 nuclei, putting them under this one, uh, at one Kelvin, uh, we can get a large polarization enhancement. So when we're talking about how much enhancement you get from uh, in hyperpolarized uh, experiments, you're usually talking maybe 10 to 100,000. Actually, about a hundred factor of 100 in there is is coming from the low temperature part of things. But this isn't the whole story. There's still there's still a bit of room for improvement. And this part is easy, the next part is hard. Um, so our second source of hyperpolarization is, is DNP, dynamic nuclear polarization. Um, and I'll, I'll go through this in more detail of, of what these different pieces are, but there's some part of DNP that it is a direct polarization transfer between the electrons, which are 100% polarized, and uh, whatever your nuclear spin is, which is under these conditions, is, is still less than 1% polarized. So there's this direct transfer of, of polarization from the electrons into your proton or carbon uh, nuclei or nitrogen, uh, whatever uh, nuclear spin you have there. And then there's also some uh, enhancement that comes from uh, spin diffusion between uh, your different uh, uh, nuclear spins. So I'll go into that uh, as well. Um, and DNP itself actually is not a, not a new phenomenon. This has been well studied since the early days of NMR. Um, and the what's got us 
in this room today is the fact that, not that we can do the DNP experiment, but we can do uh, DNP and then actually uh, uh, take this frozen uh, concentrated sample and dissolve it into a liquid that's physiologic, um, pH, temperature, and has some biological interest. So it was going from this step of the fundamental physics, which I'll talk about here, but going through the dissolution step to create an injectable liquid is, is why we're all in this room today. I think, unless anybody's in the wrong place. All right, so the, um, the, the effect that, that I uh, understand that I think is the easiest to sort of understand and, and has some real connection to some parameters you're going to use in your hyperpolarizer. Um, it's called the solid effect here. Um, and uh, this is uh, describing the transfer of spin polarization from the electrons back to the nuclear spins. Okay, um, so this is the picture we're going to use here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and go up to the board here and, and uh, draw a little bit of this out. So, All right. So, let's see if we can... so think of this as like your... Uh, a somewhat high-level, uh, short introduction to um, using, looking at the uh, spin physics through a perspective of energy levels, okay, which I warn you is not the way that I learned uh, spin physics. Um, so I glossed over that, said it's not important for MRI, but it's important for DNP, that's for sure. Okay, so the... Uh, the uh, basic idea of these types of, uh, of, of uh, diagrams that I'm going to draw here is we have, we're looking at, uh, looking at different energy levels, and actually uh, energy uh, this corresponds to, is proportional to the uh, frequency as well. And the simplest case is a so-called one, one spin system. So say we have a, some carbon-13 uh, nuclei here. And something like this. Okay. Um, and how you're going to look at this energy diagram is in the presence of a magnetic field, you get the splitting of energy levels, where um, they, get, they correspond to um, either a plus one half or minus one half spin states. This is often your spin up uh, or spin down states here. For carbon, is that that? I, I think. No, sorry, so I think this is called it's usually. I think for all nuclear spins, uh, sorry, uh, up is the lower energy state here. Yeah. So it would be like plus one. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I'd have to double check on that. Um, according to some of the, the documentation I've seen for DNP, they're referring to the, the upper energy state as, as plus one half. Um, but, uh, okay. Um, let's say there's two different energy levels because. 
I can't. Um, this is the short introduction here, conceptual. Whether it's plus or minus, what you really care about is you have a difference. Yeah. Yeah, up or down, what you really care about for the purposes of our experiments are the difference. There are some subtle differences between these two states and that one of them is going to be aligned, uh, result in an alignment with the magnetic field and the other against it. But in our case, what we really, uh, really care about is putting all our spins in one state versus the other, whether it's with or against the magnetic field is uh, not... It's I haven't seen a case for that as well. So, a um, couple things you can, you can take away from this energy diagram here is that this difference here would correspond to the, the resonance frequency of your nuclear, nuclear spin, so we'll just call that omega n. Um, and then you would estimate that, uh, let's draw a simplistic picture of, uh, you'd have a slightly higher population here at the lower energy state versus the higher energy state. And The lower energy state is considered aligned with the magnetic field. So what this means is that if you have your, um, what you can take out of this little picture here is that if you have your magnetic field aligned like this, you have some, um, well, like this, you have some net nuclear magnetization aligned with the magnetic field. And then we can actually uh, think of this uh, similar picture here for uh, electrons and not the scale here. And I apologize if I have some of my up, down, plus, minuses backwards here. We have just an electron spin. It's also just a uh, a uh, one spin system. We have an energy different uh, difference here corresponding to the uh, electron resonance frequency. Um, and then we'd have also some population difference. Uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. But what the case that we care about is, these are both one spin systems, is when we've got a, a two spin system. So what happens in that case is we end up with uh, four distinct uh, energy levels here, because Consider um, these two spins now are coupled, so they um, there's a second splitting of of the energy levels here due to their coupling. Where we have some. where the, the, uh, the size of the splitting is, again, proportional to our, either our uh, nuclear or our uh, electron resonant frequencies. And, uh, let's, and so what I'll we'll take a look at here is um, what conditions are we under uh, when we're performing uh, GNP? So, um, these two 
these four levels here correspond to the four different um, positive negative states and positive negative states of our two uh, two spins. So we either have uh, for the electron <coughs> nuclear spin, we either have positive positive negative, negative, positive, negative, negative. And keep in mind that our polarization comes from the difference in populations between these different energy states. So in this type of picture, if all these spins are at one energy level, that's going to increase our net polarization. So the basic idea behind uh, the well, the uh, the solid effect that I'm going to describe is how do we get all of our spins, all of our in this case our nuclear spins, to end up in the uh, same positive or negative configuration? Okay, so we want, for example, we want all of our nuclear spins to be either all negative, so in one of these two states or all positive in one of these two states. Um, we don't really care about the uh, electron spins in the system, but uh, from a, uh, in the end point of view, but their, their configuration is important for creating the polarization effect. Can you just have a little bit sort of true on the solid that you have coupling where it's like one radical for nucleus? Or is that how you do it in practice? Um, it no, it's actually much, much less than one radical per nucleus. So that's why this is a partial description of what's going on. There's, um, and, and I'll get I'll get into that after this. There's um, that's where um, the some so one radical uh, can be um, have a small neighborhood of nuclear spins that it's coupled to. So we'd have this kind of spin system, but then there's a number of nuclear spins that are actually too far away to experience this sort of uh, coupling. And those are polarized by uh, actual diffusion of the spin across space. So the yeah. actual the actual system is a little more complex than one radical per nucleus. Yes. So are That's there right. actually like many other splittings, or is it just still all splitting about the essentially just splitting around mm -hmm. the energy levels of the electron spin? Since I I think the electron spin kind of dominates the system. Yeah. It, it, Right, yeah. I mean, the, the, the scale here is not even you know, correct, so there's probably a more complex split set of splittings near these two uh, electron energy levels um, when you have uh, a bunch of nuclear spins in there as well. Yeah. Hence this still being a you know, PhD thesis kind of topic. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's some attempts to... to Create some uh, sort of complex simulations to 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 understand some of that because it, it becomes pretty I think intractable from a just a theoretical point of view. All right, so um, what we have. Uh, so what I want to draw now is what is this, what are the energy states in this, in our coupled spin system, what would they look like if we're at, uh, under the conditions that I showed, there we're maybe at like 1 Kelvin or 3.35 T. So under those conditions, you know that the electrons are almost 100% polarized, meaning all of the um, electron spins are actually in the same, uh, have this uh, same state. So what that means is that all our spins are actually going to lie or, uh, in one of uh, 
all of our, instead of two spins, are going to lie in one of these two energy levels. So um, what it would look like if I draw it out here is that we'll have, say, uh, a couple of our, um, we have to consider the spins together. They're a coupled system. some in this state, and then because we still do have some net nuclear polarization, there would be slightly more in one of the nuclear states versus the other. But notice there's no, if we're really at 100% electron polarization, there's no, at any equilibrium, there's no spin population in either of these two energy levels. So, um, So under these conditions, we would still have, uh, like I've drawn here, with our magnetic field, we would still have some small net uh, nuclear polarization and have some large Net uh, magnetization, excuse me. But remember, our goal with DNP is, is to increase this nuclear polarization. So taking all of these coupled spin systems and either having them in, both in one of these states with a, a, a spin up or negative uh, uh, spin for the nucleus or positive. Again, we want to be in only in these two or only in these two um, states to increase our nuclear polarization. Okay. So this is the trick here. What we do is we apply, there's two distinct microwave frequencies which we uh, use. And this is the reason why these are the same frequencies that we use. So say we use a frequency of omega, the omega electron, the electron resonance frequency plus the nuclear resonance frequency. Now in the, uh, in this sort of uh, picture of uh, the spin physics, what Applying um, a uh, energy at this frequency means that we can move um, our spins between energy states that have this are proportional to this uh, that have a separation that's proportional to this frequency. And so what we see here is actually the difference between this state here and this state here is exactly our is proportional to our one of our microwave frequencies. So if we apply this frequency, what's that, what that is going to do is that's going to take some, uh, again, we can transition between these two energy levels now that we've applied this frequency. So what that can do is that could take one of these <coughs> spin systems here and move it up. So you end up, and I'm just going to draw the, uh, the nuclear spin. Okay, so this is what we've done by applying this microwave radiation. As we transition from this energy level to this energy. But now what's happened is we've perturbed our thermal equilibrium. 
thermal equilibrium is what I drawn before. It's all electrons in the negative state and, and uh, all the nuclear spins in the mixture. But um, what we've actually got under these conditions is um, we have a, a relaxation rate of the electrons it is much shorter than the relaxation rate of the nuclear spins. And it's our T1 relaxation rates that are going to drive us actually back to, or it's relaxation generally, but in this case, the T1 relaxation rates that are going to drive us back to uh, equilibrium. So on the electron side, T1 is going to take any electron that's in the positive state and drive it back to the negative state. So let's just neglect the nuclear relaxation for now. So T1 means that we're going to transition from the positive electron state here to the negative electron state here, but we're going to keep our same uh, nuclear spin. So what happens is we get relaxation and end up with uh, basically having moved, you know, moved our coupled spin system from this energy state to this energy state first by driving this transition at that frequency, and then the relaxation of the electron going back to the electron being fully polarized. So you can imagine this continues, then we're going to end up in you know, a nice state here where it's starting to look pretty good for us. This, um, in this case, in a, or in this simplistic model, but basically what's happening in DNP is we're driving everything into this uh, single energy state. And now actually all of our, theoretically all of our uh, electron spins would be aligned and all of our nuclear spins would be aligned. So initially our electron spins were already all aligned, but now if our nuclear spins is all, are all, all aligned, we're going to end up with some overall net magnetization that is much higher than we had before. And we're going to be in if this was so truly the population distribution, we'd be 100% uh, uh, polarized. So, so what about the uh, the two uh, nuclear energy levels that are, correspond to like the positive electron energy? Is that like a would, would those yeah? So like say for instance, like we like populate that top energy level. Mm -hmm. Is that also nuclear polarization? Um, like just uh, so, if you were mixed between these two states, you wouldn't have any nuclear polarization. But yeah. if you had one or the other, yes, you would have uh, okay. uh, nuclear, net nuclear polarization. So your net nuclear polarization is due to the difference between these positive and these negative states here, and your net electron polarization is due to the difference between these positive states and these negative. Um, All right, uh, one thing here. Actually, if, uh, to be consistent with the way I've drawn it here, what we've actually done is introduce a nuclear polarization that uh, would be actually opposite to the magnetic field. So, uh, assuming that we're uh, under a magnetic field, we're slightly polarized up. The negative state are slightly polarized aligned with the magnetic field for this negative state. We've actually driven the nuclear spins into their positive state, meaning actually they're aligned against the magnetic field. So you drew a T1 U and um, so T1 M is going to be between the two uh, the two split energy levels. Then? Yeah, yeah. So if we um, 
So actually, as the at some point, uh, these uh, these nuclear energy states here will relax as well. So you do have uh, p one. And would be taking spins from this stage, spinning down, down here, <clears throat> and actually uh, reduce our nuclear polarization. And as soon as we turn our microwave, so but then you know, in a intuitive sense, as long as we have our microwaves on at this frequency, it's going to send this spin coupled spin pair back here, and then. The electron relaxation happens first, the nuclear relaxation is slower. So there's a, your, your, your polarization is fighting the nuclear relaxation. That's the, uh, the nuclear relaxation back to equilibrium. You're always in balance with that. And that also illustrates if you turn the microwaves off, then these two states here are going to go back into their equilibrium, which is the sub. 1% polarization of uh, your nuclear spins. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So if I were just thinking about this really naively, I would be like, well, why do I need the electron? Can I just put a bunch of carbon atoms in a carbon atom pair and mm -hmm. just pump that much of it? And so for carbon compression energy, it's mm -hmm. a higher energy state. Um, so uh, yeah, so then you'd be in this single spin system here. Um, and the that's a good question because it's it's a, now you're in a situation where say you pump them at this difference frequency, uh, which is basically an NMR experiment, but you can drive now actually a transition either from this state to this state or vice versa. So overall, you're actually not going to get any net polarization because you're just going to be driving um, your spins back and forth between these two uh, uh, energy levels. But here you have this, uh, um, so you wouldn't get any sort of enhancement um, in from from, uh, uh, from uh, the solid effect, at least in that case. This is the solid. It's the, yeah, so it's the, it's, it's this whole picture, the electron coupled with the carbon-13, and then <coughs> driving either this transition, or, uh, right, and it relaxes, or um, you can also do our, drive our transition actually at, um, at the uh, electron frequency minus the uh, nuclear frequency. So if we go back to our initial configuration here, what that means is now we're actually driving the transition. So and we're in a unique case here with when we have the coupled system is we don't have a, we have this uneven distribution here because of the high electron polarization. And then this frequency is going to drive the transition between these two inner inner energy levels. So what that would do would take a, intuitively it'll take a uh, two spin system here. send it up to this energy level. So that's basically, you can see that's basically swapping the, um, the states of our two spins. And then again, we'd have T1 decay, the electron, which is going to take the electron from the positive to the negative state here. So when we drive uh, our hyperpolarization, uh, you do hyperpolarization at 
electron frequency minus the nuclear frequency <coughs> should end up with all our spins now in this energy. And actually the T1 uh, nuclear spins would, would eventually put some back into, go back to equilibrium, which is almost some spins in this equation. So just getting back to like this question of why can't you use a one spin system? Uh -huh. So I guess it seems to me like with the one spin system, the if you just pulse it a lot, it's I guess what you're saying is it's kind of like doing a saturation pulse and an inclined spin. Mm -hmm. So you just end up balancing the populations. Yeah, I think that's a, a lot. Yeah. And then you know, it seems to me like it would be possible to do that. As well, if you hit them with a high enough intensity, but maybe mm -hmm. you're hitting them with like a lower intensity relative to their T1, mm -hmm. what, like a lower like amount of energy each time relative to their T1, so that they're always like returning to their lower energy state. But if you hit them mm -hmm. with a really high intensity, like repeatedly, I feel like you would you, you would probably equalize those. Um, like yeah, situation. well, so if you had the electron single spin system and say you're sort of uh, at R1K condition, um, you, you, you drive it at just the electron frequency, you're going to start to go either, either direction between these two energy states. So you're going to uh, probably end up sort of equalizing them out and basically saturating your your net magnetization, I guess, your overall polarization. But then once you turn off that RF irradiation, then these spins would go back to the equilibrium state here. So I guess the, the consequence would be with the two-spin system. Mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe there's like an intensity of RF that is like too high. It's actually suboptimal. Um, yeah, there, there, there is certainly an effect there. Um, it's not RF, actually. It's like microwave. Microwave, in this case, yeah. Mm -hmm. There might be an intensity that's too high to actually get a good polarization. Um, yeah, there might be. And I, I, I don't know if, uh, if that sort of fits into this picture or like the um, if you have to consider more of the whole, you know, throwing some more nuclear spins in there to, to get at that. Um, I, th I think that some of the, um, the effect though that you end up seeing under these conditions is that, uh, before some of the DNP mechanisms might break down in high power, you actually get a uh, heating due to, uh, some, uh, due to the energy deposition. So, uh, that uh, ends up limiting what the RF power you can use is. Yeah, great questions. Um, okay, so the, the last point I just want to make on this is that if we've instead, if, if, if we've now driven our uh, coupled spin system into this energy state, we're actually going to have opposite direction of our uh, net magnetization. So between this state and this state, what's changed is uh, our, our, our nuclear spin state, and that's going to determine the direction of our uh, nuclear net magnetization. So and I'll come into context when I show some other things here. The, the, the way you've drawn it, it's, uh, you make a magnetization go to the PC. Yeah, we still should have magnetization parallel or anti-parallel, but in this case, I think parallel. Right. Any more questions on, uh, on that? Cool.
question. Yeah. Um, on this uh, electron plus nuclear frequency and electron minus nuclear frequency, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, like, why does that work vary so much between uh, E13 and E12 compounds? Because uh, yeah, you know, that's uh, really like it can't be due to chemical shift. I guess that's like pretty small. That should be small relative to the uh, yeah, yeah the size of difference you see here. You expect sort of be the same for all compounds, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But when you actually like load in a hyperstack or something and like you know, try to calibrate what frequency you should use, you get differences of like several megahertz for different mm -hmm. compounds. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I'm not sure how to explain that. It. it, it um, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's. It, it could be that it's like between. That maybe you still have the same uh, difference between these two transitions, but that overall your uh, frequencies are shifted a little bit due to the composition of the mixture. Um, like susceptibility. Uh, that's. Uh, just a just a uh, hypothesis. The I mean, it's much larger than it should be from any chemical shift for sure. It's a bit larger than some of your magnetic fields, susceptibility, but I'm not sure how much the yeah, if there's any difference for the electron frequency shifts or something. I mean what the almost like what the uh, what the experiment to do there would be to so uh, it would be to, you have this, presumably these peaks at plus or minus the nuclear frequency. And this the difference here should only depend on um, the, the, the nuclear frequency. So a you know, chemical shift of your compound, which should be sort of pretty hard to detect uh, <laughs> when you're doing like uh, this type of measurement. But is it you know, a difference here or is it a Yeah, if you like just subtract right. the two, you kind of want to slip into it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The, uh, so the, these are, these are uh, a typical plot you might see about uh, that describes the uh, DNP enhancement. And you have these two peaks at and electron frequency minus the nuclear and plus the nuclear frequency. And that you can intuitively understand that by striving these different uh, energy uh, transitions that transfer polarization from the electrons basically to the nuclear spins. Uh, and the reason that that one is positive and one is negative is, is back to what I was mentioning before is one will align your um, your nuclear spins with the magnetic field and the other will align your nuclear spins uh, anti-parallel to the magnetic field. So which frequency you choose depends on the, um, uh, or in, uh, determines the polarity of your uh, hyperpolarization. So I yeah. One more, just to be like, can I try this at home? In this figure here, DNP is going to pump as much as you can into the second line from the top, right? Which is like a little bit different. This one here? Yeah. Um, no, so it's, uh, it, so we'd be starting in, in these states. This would be uh, this the electron minus the nuclear frequency transition here. Yeah. And then assuming the electron T1 is much faster and dominates, it would drive actually everything into the very bottom state in this case. Mm -hmm. Like, right on, like, nuclear. Mm -hmm. But then you go to the, to 
to the Remy, to the highest level, and then come back to the... Yeah, so, so what I drew was, was the actually the, di the other yeah. frequency. The other frequency. Is what I drew first, was, was this frequency. So that's driving the very bottom to the very top, yeah. and then electron relaxation back into this second from the bottom state. And this picture here is showing the electron frequency minus the nuclear frequency. So that drives a transition between these two energy inner energy levels and then T1 relaxation back to the very bottom energy level here. In which cases which cases the match have a polarization or polarized uh, either one. Um, all right, so this is the solid effect. Um, the now there's another effect which um, I cannot explain, <laughs> but I will mention it for your reference here. I find that thermal solid is like I can grasp that thermal mixing. Um, I can't give you a good explanation. If anybody else wants to volunteer and do do something sometime on it, I'd be happy to to hear it. But. Uh, uh, a general uh, impression is that uh, you can use these arguments of spin temperature and actually that the thermal mixing uh, may be the dominant effect in, in uh, experimental DNP because it typically requires uh, lower microwave powers than the true solid effect. But uh, the, the general understanding is probably some mixture of both thermal mixing uh, and you know, the solid effect. All right, so going back to um, one of the questions we talked about before, right, is, is, is it really one electron and one nuclear spin? And it's, it's absolutely far from that. It's more like one electron spin to 1,000 nuclear spins. So um, you have a picture kind of like this, where you, know, you have uh, your free radical, and you have some nearby regime of nuclear spins that there is some uh, strong coupling with. So they can be polarized either by the <coughs> solid effect or by thermal mixing in sort of some near regime. And then the way you actually polarize all of your sample is then through, uh, through spin uh, diffusion. And what that basically means is that if, say, all of your carbons here were now polarized in one direction, because of their coupling to the next carbons over, carbon-13 nuclei over, they can swap uh, states with, with these uh, nearby uh, spins as well. So if you have this fully polarized, actually, the relaxation between these neighboring spins will cause the polarization to be transferred out. So uh, spatially what happens is you first have a nearby regime that gets polarized. That polarization is transferred to a farther regime of nuclear spins. And then you continue applying your microwave radiation. And then, so these become, they give their polarization basically far spins. And then you continue microwave irradiation, polarizing your nearby spins, and it transfers out to your uh, further away nuclear spins, uh, and so on. So you have this sort of steady state uh, effect building up there. Um, so, um, we're, we're, we're at the end of time here for today, so I'm, I'm going to uh, stop right here and, and I'll, I'll wrap up the, uh, the rest of this uh, next week and uh, coordinate to finish that then because um, there's some just, uh, just a 
probably about 10 or 15 minutes more, but I think it's best safe for that. Um, any questions before we uh, break for the labs? Any more questions, I should say? A lot of good questions today. So. Yeah. Yes. On the last experiment, um, like uh, the engineer showed us the solution, say it's green color. Yes. Is that because of the electron? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so we call it the, uh, yeah, I've referred to it as the electron or free radical or the uh, electron paramagnetic uh, agent. It's a good question. <laughs> um, these are some of the different names. I think free radical is a little bit uh, charged word, so sometimes the electron paramagnetic agent is the little, sounds more sciencey. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we will, uh, if you went to Spin Lab last week, Hypersense this week and vice uh, vice versa. Thanks. Okay, guys, I think we'll uh, all get started here because I'm just going to wrap up uh, the last few. Um, Slides I had from last time on the some of the the DNP physics um, and you know the point of of a lot of this is to give you a little bit of a flavor again of what's going on behind the scenes here give you some ideas as to what what is really going to affect uh, your polarization um, you know and then the some more details of the exact uh, uh, mechanism, such as I didn't talk about uh, thermal mixing, um, you know, are uh, interesting for your future study. <laughs> um, so I wanted to come back and start with, with uh, uh, this picture here, just to kind of review. Um, and, and this actually illustrates what, um, I guess, what our mixture is here is that we have pretty low concentration of, relatively low concentration of our free radical source, and then a much higher concentration of our, uh, our, our nuclear spin of interest. And then the, and the mechanism for, for DNP is not a, really a single mechanism, it's this uh, mixture of, of mechanisms, so that there's sort of a, a, a near, near field, I guess, near range effect of the thermal mixing and the solid effect where there's uh, some direct transfer of polarization from so the electrons that are basically 100% polarized to the nuclear spins and then this polarization is spread to the to the rest of the sample through uh, nuclear spin uh, diffusion so um, this uh, says so a few of the th same things, and, and I think uh, you may hear a little bit more about this when we talk about uh, creating preparation, sample preparations. Um, and another name for the free electron source is free radicals or, or EPA, electron paramagnetic agents. The, uh, and you know, these are these, these uh, uh, rather involved uh, structures whose whose purpose is that um, you know it just just by itself a free electron will very quickly uh, be quenched it'll it'll be taken into some uh, some uh, other uh, atom um, whereas the purpose of these these agents is to actually preserve the the free electron so it doesn't degrade and, and I think that's most of the trick there is making these so that they have long stable lifetimes but the, a lot of the agents that we use, um, they do degrade when exposed to uh, potentially air, but actually uh, I think more importantly it's uh, when they're exposed to light, um, these radicals degrade. And the, a lot of the radicals that we use, including the OX63 invariants, they go from a, uh, emitting a, a reflecting green 
to reflecting a sort of red purple color when they've degraded. So you have actually a very clear indication of whether or not your, your free radical structure here has degraded. Um, and then for some of the reasons that you might can see in this type of picture is that you also want to have a very good mixture. Uh, leave this, uh, you want to have a very good mixture of your uh, these low concentration of electrons within within your sample. So you could imagine if you had this picture, but all your, for example, the the, the free radicals are quite a bit heavier. So I would, I would imagine they're sort of sinking to the bottom of your sample as it's sitting there. And if you polarize, if you you know extract from that, or uh, and you don't do a good job of mixing, you could get some sample from the top that's not going to have much free electron source. Or you get a sample at the bottom that actually has too high of a concentration of these free radical um, sources, which leads to some, some bad relaxation effects that I'll touch on a little bit here. So you do want to do a good job every time you're using a sample of making sure it's well mixed for, for sort of what's going on in this picture to have a good mixture of your, your free electrons, your, your EPA, I guess, within your sample. Um, so here I'm going to go through uh, a few results. Um, and I think the, uh, the full papers from this are posted on the website. Uh, there is sort of an optimal uh, mixture. And actually um, too much uh, radical or too little radical, for that matter, can uh, be problematic. Um, I think this is related to, uh, to some of the relaxation pathways. That you, that you can have. So there's sort of an optimal mixture that we're using. Uh, and, and my impression is that that's basically uh, defined empirically through trial and error. Um, then you could have a, uh, let's see, this is, uh, I don't need to dwell too much on this, but this is the picture that we discussed before that you have both your positive and negative enhancements. Um, around your, centered around your microwave frequency at the difference to, and then at these peaks which is which are the uh, nuclear frequency away. And you can see in this picture since the proton frequency is much larger than the carbon 13 frequency you have a different polarization frequencies for if you're doing uh, proton. Uh, I really like uh, this equation here because it's really complicated. Um, <laughs> just, I get it illustrates a point to me that this is, you know, not, there's not a quick answer to this. This is a complicated effect, uh, and it depends on a number of, number of things. Um, but a, a couple of the, the, the key ones that um, I haven't talked about as much, but that it does depend on the nuclear and electron T1s. Um, we have the microwave uh, frequency, obviously, power as well. Um, you have some parameters that define the, uh, the EPA agent itself. Um, spin temperatures in here. Uh, but the T1 is kind of an interesting one because the, the, you can co come back to this picture here. and So you, you can... Say you have your electron is polarized. Once it transfers some polarization to a nuclear spin, then to return to full polarization, it relaxes basically with the T1 of the electron. And then in our nuclear spins, once they're polarized, they're actually going to go back to equilibrium with their T1. So you have these uh, actually competing effects. Uh, and uh, basically, what I, I think the ideal case is that your nuclear T1s would be infinite. So once you're polar and you polarize them, they don't you don't lose that polarization, and that your electron T1 would be uh, zero. So that as soon as you transfer that electron polarization to a nuclear spin, the electron then returns to full polarization at equilibrium, and then you can repeat the process again. Um, and you can reduce some of this to it's a, it, it's sort of this that's where this T1 ratio comes from here. Um, 
So the, the typical buildup times that we see are on the order of the, the nuclear T1. And actually these T1s uh, in, uh, when you're at a, a low temperature with these compounds become extremely uh, long. <clears throat> and so you can see here on the, the time constant of the urea buildup here is approximately the order of the, the T1 of, of the urea itself. Um, and actually, uh, we add like gadolinium to uh, as the effect of in increasing polarization, probably by shortening the electron T1. But too much gadolinium will actually shorten the nuclear T1. So then you start, as soon as you get polarization in the nucleus, you lose it. Or the EPA itself can actually shorten the nuclear T1. So I think that's why you have to do a lower concentration of EPA uh, such that you, you keep most of your nuclear spins have a long T1. Uh, um, and then keep in mind the T1 times we're talking about here for the solid state are pretty long. And uh, these are uh, some plots from, from Galen um, showing the a simulation of the polarization buildup that as you go to shorter uh, nuclear T1s, the buildup uh, is faster. Um, but the, uh, the amount that you can, the total polarization you can get will increase as you go to shorter electron T1s. So coming back to this picture of once we transfer a, a polarization from the electron to the nuclear spin, we want it to, we want this, the electron T1 to be short uh, and we want the nuclear, well, although then the trade-off here, right, is, and what is not really captured in this, is if the nuclear T1 is short, we're actually going to overall lose some polarization as well. So this is sort of a, a, a simplified model showing that. Um, and lastly, uh, <clears throat> we often mix a little bit of gadolinium. And in particular, this uh, doterum is a, uh, or sorry, it's a, they're gadolinium chelates, so it's a gadolinium surrounded by some, uh, some chelating compound that, that keeps it, also keeps that uh, stable. <clears throat> and um, doterum is a specific formulation, or a specific uh, gadolinium chelate that is really then shown to uh, be the most effective. Um, with, when using this trital or radical that we, we, Used for particularly for pyruvate polarizations as well as other mixtures, um, and the the hypothesis here is that the gadolinium decreases the electron T1. Um, however, there's an optimal amount of gadolinium as well because the gadolinium, uh, as it's used, we know from conventional MRI, can shorten uh, nuclear T1s as well. So you you can't go dumping all the gadolinium you want here. Eventually, it shortens the nuclear T1, so you lose any polarization you generate more quickly. Uh, and if it can be shorter even in, in solution when you get it out, so which is also not good, because so you're going to decrease your lifetime. So just to, uh, to wrap up, this is kind of just a summary of what I talked about with the polarization um, and, the, and the DNP physics behind it is we're, we're utilizing high magnetic field, Low temperature are sort of the uh, more straightforward pieces that give us polarization. And then, but a big part that we're adding in there is this microwave irradiation to transfer our polarization from our electron spins to our nuclear spins by these different mechanisms. And um, the one of the, the really key parameters in the uh, polarization amount and times of the T1s of both the nuclear and the electron spins. Uh, and we also optimize things like the frequency, the microwave power, uh, as well as um, the mixture here of uh, the EPA, gadolinium, and, and our agent, um, where I think a lot of the, the optimization of the mixture actually comes back to uh, not to... Uh, giving you uh, T1 values, basically, that will, so short electron T1s and long nuclear T1s. So, um, okay, that's all I've got for today. Any, any questions before I hand it over to Cornelius? Okay. <laughs>